4, let's see this reference to the resurrection showing the importance not only of the resurrection, because the resurrection is extremely important. Jesus' ascension, his resurrection, extremely important, but also his descending. Look at verse number 8. It says, Wherefore he saith, when he ascended up on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts unto men. Now that he ascended, what is it but that he also descended first into the lower parts of the earth? So he's saying, okay, he ascended, but what is it? What really is this, uh, the, the, the fact that he ascended except that he ascended from the lower parts of the earth? Like that's where he came up from. The lower parts of the earth, by the way, is not six feet under. It's not in a cave with a, with a stone rolled over it. That's not the lower parts of the earth. You read all throughout Scripture, the nether. Nether just means lower. Look up the word nether. Look up the word lower parts. It's always going to be referring to way down below. Because beneath our feet, way below, there is burning, fire, brimstone. And the easiest way, we were just talking about this before service, the easiest way to explain to people you know, that hell is real, in my opinion, the easiest way, we have volcanoes. We know about volcanoes. What do they do? They shoot up fire and brimstone literally out of the earth, from below the earth. It's shooting up fire. Guess where it's coming from? It's coming from hell. <laughs> I mean, literally, there's a place called hell where souls go to be tortured. tortured. And, and that could be a whole other sermon. But Bible believers already should believe that concept, that hell is real. And it's a place of judgment. And that's where unsaved people go. Not the saved people, the unsaved people. Saved people have never gone to hell. And you never refer to someone, even if there were some good place, you would never call that place hell. I mean, talk about confusion. Why would you ever say, well, there's a good hell and there's a bad hell? Well, is there a good heaven and a bad heaven? No, there's not a good hell and a bad hell either. So look at verse number nine. It says, now that he ascended, what is it? But that he also descended first into the lower parts of the earth. He that descended is the same also that ascended up far above all heavens that he might fill all things. Turn to Acts chapter two. Acts chapter two is probably, this is what I'm out soul winning if someone, I don't always go in depth on Jesus' soul going to hell. Sometimes I do. And if someone, a lot of people haven't heard that before, Acts chapter 2 is just the easiest place to turn to real quick and just show them, be like, oh, I never heard that before. Well, yeah, let me show you from Scripture where it says that. And the vast majority of the time, 99% of the time, we're just like, oh, okay, yeah, I didn't know that. But it makes sense. Why does it make sense? Because I explain, hey, where do you deserve to go for your sins? Hell. Okay, well, Jesus came to pay for our sins. Where do you think he went to pay for our sins? Hell. Case closed. Very easy concept. But the Bible teaches that very thing. Look at verse number 22. We're going to get this whole thing in context. Okay, I'm not going to rip this one out of context. Normally when I show people, I'll show them one verse that just says, this spake of the resurrection of Christ, that his soul was not left in hell. I'll show them that verse and just say, hey, look, this is... But, but for the, the purpose of the sermon, I want to, I want to make sure that, that we're very clear on this. Let's get this passage in context. We're going to start reading in verse number 22 of Acts chapter 2. This is Peter preaching here. He says, "Ye men of Israel... Hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man approved of God among you by miracles and wonders and signs, which God did by him in the midst of you, as ye yourselves also know, him being delivered by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God, ye have taken and by wicked hands have crucified and slain, whom God hath raised up having loosed the pains of death because it was not possible that he should be holden of it. So right now he's just given the real quick summary. This Jesus Christ, he was performing miracles among you. You guys with wicked hands took him, you killed him, you know, and, and um, you, you, you crucified him, you slain. He said, but this same Jesus, God raised him up, right? He's just giving them this, this real quick summary. And now he's going to use the scripture to show the prophecy of that event. Just further to prove that he's the Christ. 
Because you took him, you killed him, but God raised him up from the dead. So he's going to quote Psalm 16, a portion of Psalm 16 to them, starting in verse number 25. For David speaketh concerning him. So when he's saying David speaketh, he's going to quote the Psalms because it's a Psalm of David in Psalm 16. David speaketh concerning him. I foresaw the Lord always before my face, for he is on my right hand that I should not be moved. Therefore did my heart rejoice and my tongue was glad. Moreover, also my flesh shall rest in hope because thou wilt not leave my soul in hell. Neither wilt thou suffer thine holy one to see corruption. Thou hast made known to me the ways of life. Thou shalt make me full of joy with thy countenance. And if you want to, we just exercise this. You could keep your place here in Acts chapter 2. If you want to make a note later, you could check Psalm 16. But I'm going to read for you the same passage in Psalm 16, just so you see this is the quote. And you could look along down at Acts chapter 2, and you could see that this is what he's talking about. So Psalm 16, verses 8 through 11 is what he's quoting, what he's preaching here in Acts chapter 2. You can follow along. Start back up there, verse number 25, and I'm going to read, starting in verse number 8 of Psalm 16. I have set the Lord always before me. Because he is at my right hand, I shall not be moved. Therefore my heart is glad, and my glory rejoiceth. My flesh also shall rest in hope. For thou wilt not leave my soul in hell, Neither wilt thou suffer thine holy one to see corruption. Thou wilt show me the path of life. In thy presence is fullness of joy. At thy right hand there are pleasures forevermore. Is there any doubt that he was quoting Psalm 16, verses 8 through 11? None at all. That's exactly what he was quoting. Now he's going to give the application. He just got done saying, you guys killed Jesus. You crucified him with wicked hands. You killed him. But God raised him from the dead. He's giving them the story of the resurrection. And then he quotes Psalm 16, and now he's going to explain why Psalm 16 is so important. Verse number 25, for David, oh, excuse me, verse number 29, men and brethren, let me freely speak unto you of the patriarch David, that he is both dead and buried, and his sepulcher is with us unto this day. So he's saying, let me just tell you about David. David wasn't talking about himself. Amen. This is what he's saying. He's saying when, when, when Psalm 16 was written, when this is a Psalm of David, when David spake this, he wasn't speaking this of this happening to him about his soul being left in hell, about, about his flesh not seeing corruption. He wasn't talking about himself because he says, you know what? David's dead and buried. We've got his grave here today. And it still has the bones of David in it. Verse 30, therefore, being a prophet and knowing that God had sworn with an oath to him that of the fruit of his loins, according to the flesh, he would raise up Christ to sit on his throne. He, seeing this before, spake of the resurrection of Christ. So this is where he gets this, this passage he has quoted. It's in reference to the resurrection of Christ. That is the importance of it, that his soul was not left in hell, neither his flesh did see corruption. This Jesus hath God raised up, whereof we all are witnesses. 